you know, <laughs> it's time to do something different. Like, we're not going to have this conversation again. I have come on the air with breaking news about requests for gag orders because of threats for judges and their kids more times than I could count today before I got ready. And Judge Ludig, I think it's time. I don't know who has to write the banners at the bottom of my show. I'm sorry in advance. But Donald Trump broke the rule of law. We should cover a broken judiciary in this country. Donald Trump managed to delay every federal criminal trial based on facts that he barely denies. Donald Trump managed to enlist the Supreme Court in a delay process, the highest court in the land. Donald Trump brazenly and repeatedly attacks not just judges, and I've had the privilege of sitting across not just from you, Judge Ludig, but from Judge Esther Salas, whose son was assassinated by a crazy person. Judges don't have Secret Service protecting them. They don't even always have, I mean, her child answered the door. What are we going to do different because Donald Trump sure as hell isn't changing? All right, guys, so what you just saw there was woke Trump deranged MSNBC host Nicole Wallace uh, taking a page out of Nancy Pelosi's uh, playbook and going off script by tossing the papers, okay, in frustration over the fact that everything that the mainstream liberal media, the establishment, the Democrats are throwing at Trump is just not working, right? It's not <laughs> working, okay? It's not working. And they are extremely frustrated, okay? Because, you know, going into, what is it, April now? Okay, we got, what, five or six months before the election. Um, these people were expecting for us to be in the middle of Trump's pending criminal trials, except that's not happening, okay? I mean, the only trial that looks like it's going to happen before the election, at least as of right now, is the uh, Alvin Bragg hush money Stormy Daniels case that nobody really cares about because it's <laughs> the most ridiculous case. Uh, the ones that people actually really care about, the classified documents, uh, the January 6th, the RICO case out there in Georgia, it looks like those cases could possibly get delayed until after the election, okay? And they're upset because Trump has used the tools available to him uh, as a citizen of the United States to delay the trials, to push back the trials to 100% legal means. And these people are boo whining and crying about it. Oh, Trump, Trump keeps delaying justice. He keeps delaying the trials, <laughs> right? This is what they're complaining about now, okay? Because we all know what they really want, right? They want the trials to happen. They want Trump to get convicted before the election to sway the outcome of the election. This is what it's all about, okay? Because again, if they were concerned about justice, um, they would be totally fine and okay with Trump using the tools at his disposal uh, that is given to him by the criminal justice system to uh, try to uh, prove his innocence, right? They, they would be on board with that, right? But uh, uh, clearly and obviously they're not on board with it because they don't want justice, okay? They want Trump to be thrown in jail. They want to uh, throw their political opponents in jail. Uh, not only do they want to throw him in jail, they also want to bankrupt him. Part of the reason why they are engaged in this lawfare against Trump is to financially break Trump, okay? To make it so he has to use his campaign funds to pay for his legal fees. And in the case of Letitia James and the fraudulent business fraud case against Trump, uh, they're trying to personally bankrupt Trump. Now, the left got upset and mad because it seems as if they're not going to be able to uh, personally bankrupt Trump because an appellate court in New York uh, is not requiring Trump to pay the $465 million bond that initially was required of Trump or he'd have his assets seized by Letitia James. They're now saying, no, 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 all Trump has to do is pay $175 million instead, and it's a lot easier for Trump to come up with that cash. Plus, plus, True Social... Uh, has also gone public and that has allowed Trump's net worth to increase by about three, four to five billion dollars. And of course, again, the mainstream liberal media, the woke revolutionaries, right? The liberal propagandists, they're boohoo whining and crying about that. They're mad. They're upset. They're like, eh, Trump, how's he getting so lucky? True Social doesn't make any money. It's not really worth billions of dollars. Why is Trump continuing to get away? He's so lucky. We don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that's quite literally what they're doing, right? Every single time, everything they throw against this man 
it ain't working, right? It's not working out as planned. And then they cry about it, right? They get so upset. And they're about to do that again. They're about to be boo whining and they cry over the fact that Trump apparently is not going to be broken financially when it comes to his campaign uh, funds either, right? Because they were just celebrating Biden bringing in $25 million uh, being raised in New York City with the help of Obama and Clinton, okay, um, from liberal elites, okay? They were celebrating that. Like, that's a good thing. That's a great thing, right? Taking money from these elitist billionaires is great, okay? This is what the mainstream liberal media was celebrating. It shows that Biden is strong, okay? And Trump is weak because Trump, you know, isn't doing as well when it comes to campaign cash as Biden. Well, again, the reason why is because Trump is being politically persecuted. I mean, it's unfair, right? Um, they are forcing him to use these campaign funds to pay for his legal expenses. But anyways, the tide could turn when it comes to campaign fundraising as well, okay? Because Trump is looking to raise over $30 million next month at his own fundraiser. Take a look. All right, this is some context for you on where we are in the cash race, right? Joe Biden well ahead of Donald Trump in terms of cash on ha hand at the end of last month. But in terms of money raised, right, Joe Biden's fundraiser tonight, $25 million. Trump for the entire month of February only raised $20 million. That's how big that $25 million is. It's a large chunk of change, a historic chunk, as the Biden campaign was hinting at. And again, a little bit more context. How much would Trump need to sell to reach $25 million? You know, he's selling those Bibles, those God bless the USA Bibles. He would need to sell more than 400,000 of those to reach $25 million. And he would, and those, remember those Trump never surrender sneakers, he would have to sell approximately 62,657 of them. So that's why he's looking forward to that big fundraiser next month. Because simply put, this type of stuff, this gimmicky stuff, ain't going to get him there, Laura. So Trump has his own big fundraiser heading into August where he may, in fact, outraise Biden's big bash. He's hoping to raise $33 million. My goodness gracious. And how much for the top ticket? At this point, it's looking like $814,600. So the fact is, Biden is doing a lot tonight, but Trump may do a lot come April, Laura. Yeah, so you see that you heard that. Now, before I get into this, I want to be clear. I'm not celebrating a system where... It is normal for billionaires to be buying off our elections, okay? I'm not celebrating that. I'm not even saying that's a good thing. I actually think that uh, we should be striving to get money out of politics, right? I don't like a system in which you have political candidates relying on donations from billionaires in order to win elections. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but that is the reality of our politics today. And I'm simply pointing out the difference between how the mainstream liberal media covers Biden raising 25 million from liberal elitist, okay, while ignoring the death of a police officer, a fallen police officer, um, versus how the mainstream liberal media is going to cover Trump raising millions of dollars from billionaires, okay, because Trump is going to have his own fundraiser where he could pop, uh, quite possibly outraise Biden and the mainstream liberal media, they're already upset, right? They're already mad and calling foul. And they're basically going to try to shame these billionaires for donating to Trump. Because again, they're trying to rig the game so that Trump doesn't have enough money to compete with Biden when it comes to campaign financing. And uh, essentially, th this is what uh, Van Jones is going to do, okay, um, in regards to trying to sound the alarm on Trump courting some billionaires as potential donors to his campaign to help out with the fundraising. So without further ado, let's get into it. Private meeting with Elon Musk in Florida earlier this month. You'll remember that. But what we didn't know until now was who else was there. It turns out a whole bunch of other billionaires. The Washington Post reports that they were joined by Republican mega donor Nelson Peltz, the casino mogul Steve Wynn, and also the former Marvel chairman Isaac Perlmutter. Now, you may be wondering, why does it matter that a former president had breakfast with all these billionaires? Well, it does because of which particular billionaires it was. It was just three years ago that Peltz said that the January 6th Capitol was a disgrace and that he was sorry he had ever voted for Donald Trump. Now, he tells the Financial Times he'll probably vote for him in November. He's not the only one. There are also a handful of other billionaires, according to the Washington Post in their new report, who are coming around on Trump quietly throwing their support, but more importantly, their money behind the former president. I want to bring in CNN political commentator Van Jones, who worked in the Obama administration. 
and CNN's senior political commentator, Scott Jennings, who is a senior advisor to Mitch McConnell. And, and Scott, I, it does speak to the moment of, you know, what we are watching, this political comeback of Donald Trump's. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable, actually, but I hate to break it to you guys. It's not just billionaires. I mean, if you look at the polling on what people say, whether they approve of Donald Trump's job versus Joe Biden's job in office, Donald Trump is in positive territory. People remember his years fondly because they're comparing it to Joe Biden's administration. And I think what's happening with these billionaires and other Republicans and donors is that they had no idea that Joe Biden was going to run an administration like this. He ran a campaign as a moderate deal maker, a transformational or transitional figure. And he's turned out to be a real ultra progressive president, probably the most liberal progressive president we've ever had. So I think that's why you're seeing people return to the fold for Donald Trump right now. Well, uh, but quickly on that, Scott, you know, none of us are billionaires on this panel that I'm aware of, at least. But <laughs> but the sense that they're doing it so quietly, don't, don't you think it's also that they're just really wealthy and they want to be close to whoever is in power because it'll affect them and their money potentially? Well, I mean, they're doing it so quietly because they know that they'll be shamed, right? If they come out and they, you know, publicly support Trump or they endorse Trump, they'll be called, um, you know, insurrectionist uh, sympathizers, right? They'll be accused of aiding and embedding the overthrowing of our democracy, a.k.a. Democrat power, right? Because that's what they actually really mean by democracy is the de democracy TM, right? That's what it actually really is, okay? Um, again, it reminds me of that interview that Kevin O'Leary did with uh, Don Lemon, where Don Lemon was extremely concerned about Kevin O'Leary and whether or not he would support Trump, right? I mean, Don Lemon kept pressing Kevin O'Leary on whether or not he would donate to Trump's campaign. And Kevin O'Leary is like, look, I'm not going to tell you what I'm going to do, right? I, I am bipartisan, okay? I, you know, support whoever's going to help me make the most money, right? He, he basically, he was non-committal, okay, about who he's going to donate to. But of course, he's going to donate to somebody because these billionaires, the policies of these, you know, leaders of the country affect their bottom line. So, of course, they're going to donate in order to try to support the candidate that's going to uh, do the best for them. OK, and that is essentially how the game is played. Again, I'm not saying I support it. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing. I'm just saying personally, that's what it is. Right. That's the system. OK, but see, in 2024, if you're a billionaire, uh, you can't look out for your own financial interests in regards to who you want to donate to. You also have to make sure that you are falling in line with the establishment or else, you know, as we saw in the case of Letitia James, they may try to bankrupt you. Right. Um, you can see that the Biden administration is weaponizing the DOJ to go after Elon Musk, who has become an enemy of the Democrats, uh, mainly because of his acquisition of Twitter and pursuit of free speech okay that is a threat to the establishment they didn't like that and um they've essentially tried to punish elon musk for it okay so we're already seeing what happens when you uh stand up against the biden regime okay even if you are a billionaire they will try to punish you they will try to bankrupt you they will do what they can to try to put you back in line if you do not go along with their agenda. So, yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of billionaires, I think, are probably interested in donating to Trump for various reasons, because Trump's economic policies are just better for the whole country. Right. <laughs> not just for, you know, the middle class or even the upper middle class. But also, I mean, look, when the middle class does well, the wealthy do well. OK, <laughs> under the Trump administration, thanks to Trump's economic policies, the middle class did well. The wealthy did well. Now, the difference with Democrats is that the wealthy do well under Democrats. The middle class doesn't. Right. That's why we're seeing the wealthy do very well under Biden. OK, but the middle class, not so much. OK, um, again, just look at the, the stock market. OK, the stock market uh, has reached uh, all time highs uh, despite the increased interest rates. Um, but the middle class is struggling with inflation. Right. So, again, that kind of shows you how there's a disconnect between how the rich are doing versus how, you know, normal everyday people are doing. And again, that's just a hallmark of Democrat policies in, in the Biden administration. Sure. I mean, I, I assume they're like any other. Amer By the way, Van's closest if you're keeping <laughs> sport at home. Of the three of us. But I, <laughs> right. But, but I, I assume they're like any other American voter. They're looking at this administration and saying, none of this is good for me. And maybe they're thinking it's not good for the country. 
And so they, like the rest of us, are probably casting around for which politician might be uh, giving them the best deal based on what policy actions uh, they would take. So I, I, I cannot underscore enough, though, there are Republicans who are deeply unsatisfied with Trump after January 6th who are coming, this is happening across the board, who are coming back around based on what they've seen out of Biden. It is Biden's fault for being too ultra progressive and not being a more middle of the road president. Van, what do you make of all this? Uh, I, I just, uh, I, I love my brother Scott. I just, I see it very differently. I, I don't know what ultra liberal president he's talking about. Um, the, you have a, a bipartisan infrastructure bill, uh, the CHIPS Act to keep uh, China from, uh, you know, destroying our uh, technology capability, making sure we're, we're strong here. I mean, which particular bill are you talking about that most of them are passed on a bipartisan basis? Uh, and by the way, well, I can tell you which bill we're talking about. Well, I mean, let's start with the so-called American Rescue Plan, which was one point nine trillion dollars in spending that we did not need following Joe Biden uh, becoming president in 2021. OK, we did not need that extra stimulus. However, Democrats decided to pour another two trillion dollars into the economy, regardless of the fact that. We should have been opening back up the economy at that point. We should have stopped the lockdowns. We should have been sending kids back to school. We should have been incentivizing people to go back to work. The fact that Democrats decided to extend the lockdowns, to extend the whole pandemic nonsense, along with the ultra progressive spending, that is what was a major catalyst to the inflation that we are experiencing today okay that was an ultra progressive agenda maintain lockdowns keep paying people not to work keep pouring more money into the economy okay uh interest rates were also still super low that was the recipe for disaster okay and i'm not saying that we would not have had any inflation had that plan not uh been passed however I think that that plan definitely pour a lot more fuel on the fire and i think that it made it a lot worse than it would have been okay um so you know when van jones talked about what policy well again that was one of the most progressive policies that we've ever seen right from an administration also on top of that i mean again you look at the inflation reduction act aka the lifestyle <laughs> reduction act the standard of living reduction act that also increased inflation okay um again it, it's not just bills that were passed in congress that biden supported um, it's also, again, the pandemic era policies that Biden put in place in order to extend the lockdowns unnecessarily that really, really, really hurt the country and put us in a bad place, especially when it comes to this conversation about inflation. Way the economy feels bad for most people because food prices are stuck up too high and housing is too high. But the unemployment rate is low. Gas prices are, are comparatively low. Uh, the stock market is up. Like I don't, this, this idea that we're living through some hellscape with this crazy liberal president and before with Donald Trump, everything was so wonderful. I just don't, we're living in different realities. I remember everybody waking up uh, afraid to check their phone every morning because Donald Trump was going to do something else ter terrifying or, or crazy or norm busting. And I also remember him dropping the ball uh, in the middle of the pandemic and putting us into one of the worst recessions we've ever had. So ridiculous absolutely ridiculous you know what's so funny about these people first and foremost he said well we're living in two different realities yeah we are right like van jones you're rich right so of course you don't care about uh housing prices or the price of food uh, of course that doesn't affect you that much okay so you're not gonna see eye to eye with normal everyday americans on that so it doesn't surprise me that van jones is living in a different reality okay uh because he claims that under trump well he was waking up every day worried about uh i don't know what Trump would do as president, right? When under Trump, his economy was great. Except until the pandemic, in which this is what really bothers me about liberals and their criticism of Trump. They want to try to blame Trump for the economy during the pandemic, but yet they never articulate what would they have done differently than Trump? What would they have done differently than Trump? Because the criticism of Trump is that, well, he wasn't authoritarian enough, right? He did not force all these states to shut down and shut down the whole economy right shut down the whole country oh trump wasn't doing that enough that was the criticism because when it came to the legislation that was agreed upon by democrats and republicans trump signed that legislation he signed legislation to keep money in people's pockets also in the pockets of corporate america as well too uh to keep these businesses and corporations afloat 
while we try to figure out what the hell is going on with the pandemic. So what else would have Democrats done that would have been different? That's what that's what really blows my mind. They, they can't articulate anything because the only thing I can think they would have done that would have been different was they would have extended the lockdowns. The lockdowns would have been even worse on the Democrats, right? And if that's the case, then you cannot sit here with a straight face and try to tell me the economy would have been better. So you would have locked down more people and you would have spent more money. What do you think the result would have been after the pandemic? Way higher inflation. If you think that the inflation that we're dealing with right now is, is bad, imagine what the inflation would be like had there been a Democrat president at the time and the Democrats had complete control over Congress. What do you think would have happened? Well, we know what would have happened. Look at the proposals they were putting out there, the progressive plans they was putting out there. They wanted to spend four, five, and in some cases, $10 trillion, okay? And they wanted to lock down the country even more. So just imagine the disaster that would have been had we spent $10 trillion, which is what Democrats want to do, $10 trillion in one bill, along with extending the lockdowns. We, bruh, this country would be unrecognizable, okay? We'd be on a fast track to Venezuela. That's what would have happened. Again, it's not like Democrats are coming out here and saying, oh, we, we would have not locked down the country at all. We would not have spent all that money if we uh, had con complete control of Congress and we had a White House. That's not what they're saying. And that's what really blows my mind about this criticism of Trump and the pandemic is that they try to blame Trump for a once in a lifetime pandemic that nobody knew what the hell was happening at the time. And they try to act like that the Democrats would have done such a better job. They would have saved more lives. When most of the lives that were lost as a result of COVID at the beginning of the pandemic was because of Democrats and their policies and what they were doing in their states. Trump didn't have anything to do with the uh, thousands of people dying in nursing homes in New York under Andrew Cuomo. Trump had anything to do with that. But they were blaming Trump for every death. Again, these people make me sick, right? They really do with their nonsense. I don't know why these billionaires are doing what they're doing. I will say this. Uh, Donald Trump's ability to consolidate the support he's consolidating should scare the crap out of everybody. Because you, we've just spent the first 26 minutes of this show laying out a, a, a mobster-style uh, approach to power on behalf of this person. And if he gets power again, none of the people who are around him right now will be safe. Ask the billionaires who supported Putin and who wound up in all kind of trouble. <laughs> this is a trouble, troublesome, I, I had to defend my president, I had to defend our president, but this is a troublesome development. Some billionaires uh, have uh, uh, more concern about their economic value than their democratic values. Well, Van, I mean, on that note and what you just laid out, and, and I, Scott, I wanna get your take on this too, but Van, first to you, the Washington Post, or, or excuse me, Politico, Jonathan Martin is reporting that in this moment, all of the people who, the Republicans who are not voting for Donald Trump, that are not supporting him and have made very clear, including on this show, that they will not be voting for him in November, uh, Mitt Romney, Mike Pence, Susan Collins, Larry Hogan, Chris Christie, George W. Bush, none of them have heard from Joe Biden. Why is that? Do you think he should reach out to them? <laughs> Well, if he hasn't, I would call that political malpractice. Um, we, we need the biggest, broadest tent possible. Uh, the the pro-democracy forces, the anti-authoritarian forces include Republicans, independent, Green Party, Libertarians, Democrats, and further to the left than, than Democrats, all have an interest in making sure wow. we don't have an authoritarian in the White House. And so if, wow. if Biden has not reached out to them, uh, look, it's, it's, still, it's still early tonight. I hope he'll pick up the phone and do it right now. Scott, what do you think? I think everything Joe Biden does is aimed at Democrats or people who consider themselves to be more liberal than Democrats. I think he does very little to nothing to aim at the middle of the country or the center right that you're talking about that could probably be had. He didn't do it in the State of the Union. They don't do it in their campaign messaging. Maybe they'll get there someday, but I don't see evidence of it so far. Yeah, I think Van Jones is delusional, right? That's what I think. Okay, he thinks that... Uh, the left is anti-authoritarian when these are the same people that are quite literally weaponizing the government to try to censor speech online that they don't like, right? So, again, they want to make it seem like, you know, well, if you're against authoritarianism, then you need to vote for Biden. When, like, Biden is an authoritarian. He's the most authoritarian president in my lifetime, right? In fact, there's no other president that's been more authoritarian than Joe Biden, okay? But, yeah, this guy is trying to make it seem like the authoritarian is, is Trump, right? And, again, it's just... It's ridiculous. It really is. Uh, this guy, Van Jones, I'm not sure exactly why 
they continue to bring this man on, uh, he routinely has very, very, very uh, bad takes <laughs> when it comes to politics. I, I think he honestly just be BSing at this point. I mean, for this guy really to say that the far left is not authoritarian is just ridiculous to me. But anyways, um, yeah, I predict that uh, if Trump raises more money than Biden doing um, his fundraiser, the mainstream of media is going to freak out and they're going to start smearing these billionaires. OK, they're going to say that they are funding uh, the destruction of democracy, et cetera, et cetera. OK, and um, we'll see what happens. Right. The meltdown will be amazing because, again, this will be a another uh, front. OK, that the left will lose on when it comes to trying to stop Trump. Right. They're trying to stop Trump on all fronts. And they seem to be failing, okay? It, it's been a disaster. Let me know what you guys think. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe. Most importantly, share a Black Conservative perspective. Peace.